number of important issues today. And I think that the place to start is by emphasizing the role of the university, particularly a public university like this, which is to create an arena for civic engagement that allows for the open expression of ideas without necessary reference to their validity or to their relevance to a topic. What we started with this morning was a seminar on Mexico and the United States, cooperative approaches to shared human security. We moved, after a great discussion this morning, to a more specific discussion about the role of women and the role of the organizations that rely on human resources to support their mission, objectives, and achievement. Obviously, you can't deal with issues of peace, security, border protection, environmental protection, commerce, or any of the issues that both divide and unite Mexico and the United States without considering the particular perspective and the importance of women in achieving this effort. What we saw today was the blending of a number of different perspectives on relations between Mexico and the United States, many of them involving policy issues that are quite contentious. What we showed today is that if you have a big enough tent, one that includes a variety of perspectives, a variety of nationalities, one that includes academics, practitioners, students, members of the business community, members of the press, and members of non-governmental organizations. If you are willing to engage in ways that involve multiple languages and cultures, you can achieve important objectives together. And more important than that, unless you make a conscious effort to include those different perspectives, languages, and cultures, you aren't making the tent big enough, so you will be solving small problems easily. But it's much more important to tackle difficult questions that may never be resolved, because they are continuing efforts. And I think in this case, if you look at the 450 years of history, the 500 years of history almost, between the United States and Mexico, we will include these different elements. It gives me great pleasure at this point to do the penultimate, the second to the last event in this symposium, which is a round table. You will see four of my colleagues, ones who have been involved in the program both this morning and this afternoon, who will be talking about key issues that underlie relations between the United States and Mexico. We have some time for them to present their questions, their points of view, and I would like to include you in this discussion. You are the ones who will need to tell us what we are doing right and what we are doing wrong. And more important than that, what we are doing right but in the wrong way. So this is our effort to engage the community to be a beacon for civic engagement rather than an ivory tower, one that represents the university as an integral part of the communities we serve. And those communities, in my case, include working with colleagues in Mexico, Claudia Rivera Hernandez and Roberto Moreno and Juan de Dios Pineda, and with my colleague and longtime friend Faustino Pino, who is a senior executive service retiree in the Federal Bureau of Investigation, with lots of international experience and multicultural experience. So I'd like to start by asking each of my participants in the round table to talk about what their main points would be that they would make 
having participated in and having witnessed this entire day's symposium. And I will start with Claudia. <laughs> as a representative of Mexican universities and as the Mexican woman would like to give some comments, her general conclusions, and some points of interest as her takeaways from this particular discussion.
And I, uh, I think that I am a very privileged person because I know a lot about the federal government practices in the USA. And I think that this organization has been doing really great several, uh, and several uh, activities. And to me, as a Mexican, I have to think that uh, we are not doing very well in the last 12 years. Uh, when uh, President Cedillo uh, uh, left uh, his presidency, we were the ninth economy in the world. Now, after 12 years, we are about the 18th or 17th economy around the world. That's, that's implied a lot of things. Uh, less production, more poverty, more uh, corruption in all the governments, federal, state, and municipalities. And this is the thing that we need to learn from the USA. I think there are transparency in this uh, country. There are, uh, the rules are very well observed for people. And if we need to learn uh, things from federal government in Mexico, whatever we have to learn about best practices from local government, because the federal government in Mexico is not doing good, local governments are disaster. Now we can find that uh, we want to have an election next year. And you can read the news, and three days ago, one of the candidates was killed. For who? It's not clear. And the people that need to be the substitute, he doesn't want to take that position, because also he can can have also the same treatment. In other words, um, we need to learn a lot about um, good practices in federal government, but more even good practices in local government. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Juan de Dios. Let me say that as one of the results of this symposium, Roberto Moreno and I have discussed the possibility of bringing a group of graduate students from Mexico specifically to meet with local government officials in Colorado Springs and to share ideas. Because technology transfer, soft technology transfer, such as we are doing, has to be reciprocal if it's going to be effective. And what we are going to do is to meet and to share ideas about improving local government from my colleagues and my friends who work for El Paso County in the city of Colorado Springs. So we are moving in that direction and one of the advantages of holding a conference like this is it provides a springboard to consider future possibilities that might have seemed beyond our reach when we first started. So I agree with you totally one of the ways that we can help is by sharing ideas on local government. I would note that one of Mexico's most prestigious administrators, Enrique Cabrera Mendoza, is now head of CONACYT, the Mexican government agency in charge of higher education policy. And he received, about 15 years ago, the United Nations Award for conducting global research on effective local government policies and practices. Enrique and I have been friends and colleagues for as long as Roberto and I have been, that is, almost 20 years. And I look forward to continuing interchanges with Mexico as we discuss common solutions to shared problems. that we have, the mass migrations that we have. 
half a million people on a yearly basis, the six to eight hundred metric tons of cocaine and methamphetamine that, come, that comes into the United States on a yearly basis, and talk about the federal government and their role. I happen to think they're doing a pretty damn good job, but they need help. Point number one. My mom and dad were uh, born in Juarez. Everybody know where Juarez is? Anybody not know where Juarez is? <laughs> Juarez, and then they became uh, citizens of the United States. They took the test, they did all the things that needed to be done at that time, and they passed it. Then I came around. Uh, from the time I was six years old, Mom, one of the widest people I've ever known. Can everybody hear me all right? Yes. yes. I can't hear myself. <laughs> uh, would tell me, mijo, mijo, la universidad. Tú vas a ir a la universidad. Well, six year old, I don't know the university. <laughs> but when I got to about eight or nine years old, I knew what the university was. And sure enough, uh, because of her, I went. University at uh, Texas at El Paso, worked on my uh, baccalaureate and worked on my master's. During that process, as if, you, if you can go back with me in history, during that process, you know, you sow your oats when you're in college. All of us did, did we not? Yeah. Anybody that didn't do it? <laughs> now, I was no different. Consequence of that was living in El Paso. I, I became very good friends with the guy that was supposed to be the next uh, next mafioso in El, in El Paso. I was uh, first hand name basis with people that were dealing in narcotics, were dealing in marijuana. To be quite honest with you, they offered me a cut of the action, and it was very tempting. I'll be the first to tell you. But somewhere. Uh, I think it was, where's the lady that said, the way you're, you're raised, she's not here anymore. Uh, the way my mother and dad raised me put up all kinds of red flags in terms of the narco truck country. And I didn't fight. Going, graduating from college, I then applied for a job, a uh, federal uh, service entrance examination. This may be well beyond. And applied for a management intern job. And this is where I met this guy. Fair enough? <laughs> and Lord and behold, my life changed after that. But Don and I went up the ranks fairly fast. Uh, thank goodness we were educated. We may not have been as bright as some of these kids from. Harvard, and Yale, and Tufts University, and, and uh, Howard University there in, in Washington, D.C. But we got through. We, we went through this process. He went his direction, <coughs> I went my direction. I stayed with the federal government. And Don went through the academia. Uh, we always kept in touch. We always helped each other we, if we had, whenever he had a chance. He'd, uh, you know, see me and I'd see him. I mentioned that to you. Because that's what brought me to this, this conference. I retired from the FBI at probably one of the highest grades that there is. And I'm not bragging because there were people that were higher than I was in the federal government. But for uh, a kid from El Paso, a Mexican kid from El Paso, who was supposed to talk with an accent, I guess you picked up on my accent, right? <laughs> <laughs> you didn't pick up on my accent. Uh, kid from, from the Mexican side to, to, first of all, be accepted by the federal government, and two, to then go up the ranks in the federal, and I have to tell you, I, I went up pretty fast. And then to be invited by William S. Sessions. 
But anybody know the William S. Session? Director. Former director of the FBI. Calls me up and he says, Faustino, I want you to come to work for me. And there's a story about that, but I don't have enough time to go into the story. It's a comical story. <laughs> and, uh, well, hell, I'm in control, right? <laughs> <laughs> William S. Sessions called me. I was the, I was the associate director for a hate crime operation. We were working with the Department of Justice in Washington, D.C. And so I picked up the phone and I said, Faustino, can you? He said, Faustino, this is William S. Sessions. I want to, I want to talk to you. What the hell is this? <laughs> I said, yeah, Robert, is that you? Juanito, is that you? And he said, so I could hear the frustration at the other end. He says, Faustino, take this number down. Yes, sir. Call me right back. <coughs> the FBI, you have to go through the exchange. So I call the FBI. And uh, FBI exchange. I started shaking. I said, what in the hell's going on here? I, I just insulted the FBI director. He picked up the phone and he is laughing. He says, "We used to do the same thing when I was when I was a judge." <laughs> so everything was well. He offered me the job, and I wasn't sure I wanted to take it. I said, uh, "Right here." That's, uh, the job was that we had uh, uh, internal problems within the FBI, in the, in the worldwide, uh, and they were uh, of the type that you know you had. Racial conflicts in the FBI. We had blacks, black agents. So we had uh, 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 Hispanic agents, white agents. Mormons played a big role in this, and we had female agents. My job was to bring peace to the family, and I said, "Right, that's going to take an awful lot." He says, "How about you? Know, I'll make sure that when you get out of here, you'll be at the highest level in." in civil service, and he pretty damn well met that. I was very, very happy with that. Uh, during <coughs> that process, I interacted with Border Patrol, Immigration Naturalization, uh, CIA, uh, National Security Agency, uh, Drug Enforcement Agency, and I, can t I could hold you here, Kathy, for three hours. I would have enough stories that have you all of course laughing at some of the things we got into. This crazy things in the law enforcement agency. But the thing that stuck with me was I saw how they operated, I saw how they resolved problems, and when they and then they started gravitating towards me saying, Faustino, we're gonna do this. Uh, one DEA problem they were having uh, the director of I happened to know we used to drink beer together. Uh, I said, Faustino, I don't want to talk to anybody else. But I'll talk to you. Let's work something out. So we figured out problems, and that that was my stroke here. Is that about right? Cinco minutos. Cinco minutos. <laughs> Forget that cinco minutos down. It ain't gonna happen. <laughs> but so what happened then? I became somewhat of a quasi expert, and in that quasi expertise, I worked with all of these. I was on the board for the CIA in resolving their internal problems. I had uh, worked with NSA, working on intelligence problems. And uh, it was fun. It was good. I was good at it. So when Don came to me and said, listen, how would you like to be on a panel, this panel? And I had yes. I'm not so sure that I endorse academia. <laughs> of course I do. I really do. What you guys do is fantastic and it's helpful. But I was a practitioner. You came with me to a problem and I'm going to resolve your problem in the fastest, most efficient way and within the law. And uh, when he asked me this, he said, look at the border situation. And I did. The border situation within the United States right now is at a low point. We could very well 
lose our sovereignty as a result of the amount of narcotics that are coming in on a basic yearly basis. Think about it. That means the United States government topics. And let me tell you, it's very, very possible. When you add up the other dynamics, the uh, $16 trillion debt that we have, the pressures coming in from it, it's, it's a real, very real situation. I put that aside. And I said, what about Mexico? Uh, I looked at Mexico. I interviewed someone in the neighborhood of 16 people, all the way from Border Patrol agents, DEA agents, FBI agents, and some of them were still working, so you'll never find out who they are. I wouldn't divulge that. And I said, let's see, tell me what we can do. And the, the first thing that came to mind was we have to secure the border. Secure the border. What does that mean? That means that people coming into the United States are going to have to be identified and apprehended and detained. Okay? And that's what we're doing here. The problem is this. We've got a 1900 a my border, and it's porous. So porous that on the average, we have a half a million people that migrate into the United States illegally every year. Sort of mind-boggling. Blew me away. In addition, we have about, conservatively, about 900 tons, 900 metric tons, narcotics coming in. So I'm sitting there with the Border Patrol guy and said, don't you catch any of this? Pardon the word. <laughs> you don't you catch any of this shit? <laughs> we do, Buster. You know, we only catch 20%. So when we figured out the calculations, we're figuring somewhere in the neighborhood of about 900 tons of, of, uh, of metric uh, cocaine, amphetamines, and, uh, and heroin. And I said, well, what happens to it? I mean, marijuana, double the figure. So I said, what happened? You can't see a, a, uh, a van, a semi-trader coming through with all this stuff in it. You, they have ingenious ways. Mexicali. In Mexicali, they dug tunnels from Mexico all the way into Mexicali. Some of the tunnels directly into railroad stations. Can you imagine how much cocaine, heroin was moved? Uh, so, what we're doing now with these guys is developing a practical plan for Mexico and the United States to join together. Así, compadres, to fight the narco traffic country. You know, it's going to take 10, 15 years to do that. You know, in my, in my processes of research, uh, there was an article in which this correspondent from Mexico found out that the cartel every year, they're sophisticated, they're, they're doing a billion dollar business, every year, how much would you guess they budget for to give out bribes? Any, any guesses? Anybody? Two million, right here, one man may go for two million. Anybody else? Anybody else want to try it? Two billion. One billion dollars a year. Just for bribes. So I said, yeah, well, I can, send, I can understand it. I was naive. Like, I can understand it. Bribes for Mexican people. Mexican side. Mayors know. No. No. No way. You look at the American side, and the bribes are coming in there also. So the, in, in the American side, we're just as guilty as anybody else in, uh, in you know, caving into the whims and, and likes and dislikes of the cartel. Uh, keep that in the, in the back of your mind, because the ramifications of closing down the border, securing the border, will give us a great deal of positive type of data that we can use for our country and for Mexico. 
Mexico last year, what? 30,000 people died through the cartels. You know, groups of students are disappearing from the face of the earth. So if we start edging back on the uh, cartels, all this is going to subside eventually. Not right away. Is it going to happen without a fight? No. It's going to happen with, with a fight. Cartels, on the average, make about $16 billion a year. $16 billion a year. That's amazing. That's bloody amazing to me. So they can afford to have, what? The best guns, the best intelligence, the best vehicles, the best boats, the best uh, accountants, the best lawyers, and they utilize them. These guys are not stupid. They're smart. Okay. So, in wrapping it up, give this to some thought as to what we need to do. And, and I'm a practitioner. I'm proposing to you, I think this will work down the road, but it's not going to be easy. Thanks. Send Faustino Pino to an assertiveness training class <laughs> because he's a smart person, but he's shy. <laughs> and we figure this is what he needs to unleash his potential to be a positive force for change in society. Well, I may make a suggestion. Yes, sir. Uh, contrary to your point, uh, Faustino, uh, your clarity and interest in speaking, I think you're perfect for academia. <laughs> and you can save the money for the uh, certain <laughs> that, That's the biggest compliment someone's paid me today. <laughs> what questions and comments do you have as we come to the close of this afternoon's session? What should we do more? What should we do better? What should we do differently? <coughs> Good question, Don. You mentioned the uh, potential for an exchange. Mexican students coming to uh, Colorado Springs, El Paso County, talking to uh, uh, local county, perhaps state officials. Thoughts of, of a return exchange to learn from Mexican governors? Yes. And we will do those exchanges. Governor Hickenlooper is sponsoring, with other countries in Latin America, a biennial of the Americas, which will take place in Denver between June and August. And we want to build on that event, we want to build on the Western Conference of Governors to involve this university in exchanges not only with Mexico, but with other countries throughout the Americas. So when you do one thing, it leads to the possibility for doing other things, and yes, we will work on that. Okay, let me give you a some data. Um, President Obama signed an agreement with the present Mexican President agreements say the initiative is called 100,000. Okay, I don't know exactly. Mexico sent 6,700 students to USA to study English. Every student, the Mexican government paid $7,000 per each student in average. But USA has not sent any students to Mexico. That's not good because we need a change. USA has the same problem with China. This program started with China maybe three years ago. And China is sending a lot of people here in USA. And I think, I don't, I don't know exactly this, but I think that also uh, USA government uh, has not completed the same amount of students sending to China. I think that it's a fair for this program because <coughs> we need to have students to, to share great country like this country, but also they need to share from other people. That's important. Uh, uh, we, need to, we need to put uh, American people to support <coughs> the war, because the little uh, Latin American people uh, know very well this country. Chinese people know very well this country, but we can say the same thing for uh, American students. I am a professor from the University of Binkai, 
at uh, Yangin University in China. And I see everything. I can send Chinese people to the University of Puebla. Last year I sent 20. Two years ago I sent 20. <coughs> and I can send just three students from Puebla to China. And I, I, I don't see any student going to Mexico with this initiative. Another information, just one minute. No, this is one minute. Okay, just one minute. Uh, I was the representative from Governor Richardson in the border conference. I was representative from the government and also was representative from the University of New Mexico. And we did a master plan uh, initiative uh, in the border conference, you know, USA and Mexico together. And we had the same issues as like traffic, education, employment. Etc. Etc. I think that we are not doing very well. I'm not talking about USA. I'm talking about Mexican government and USA government because now we have more problems with uh, <coughs> in the border. We are producing a lot of, for example, in Mexico, export two billion billion to Latin America thanks to the exchange with Mexico. But there are more problems now with the policies. Uh, more people are coming from Central America. We learned this morning that, I don't know, but dozens of students, no students, the kids, were killed in the United States illegally. They entered it, just, just kids, not at all, just kids. That means that we are not, we are not doing very well, and this is not good, because uh, I have seen my country going down. I really sad for this reason. I say, four years ago we were the ninth economy in the world. Now we are 17 or 18. We don't have any income. I don't want to see this kind of things in this corner. I don't worry about it. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> what we are doing here is sharing our fears and our hopes. We're also, and I'm going to borrow this page from J.D. Smith's book, and that is, we also function within the law. And for the past three years, it has not been possible to use university funds for me or any other faculty member to visit Mexico, because it's on the State Department's list of dangerous places. Now, I find ways, and I go to Mexico four or five times a year. But you can imagine the difficulties in bringing groups of students if the main concern is legal and financial risk exposure on the part of the university, rather than the opportunities for shared learning and understanding. So we operate within our own sets of laws and regulations, and we do what we can to change them. And we don't agree with them all in the process. Uh, just one clarification, that's a university policy, not a State Department policy. Right. Then, there was a program at Boulder that they had run for 18 years, and in, uh, uh, the exchange program with Buap in Puebla, in the School of Education in Boulder, that run it successfully for 18 years, and they shut it down two summers ago because of the university's regulations. And I will accept that. It could be the university's response based on its own legal counsel's advice. Issue. And thank you for the correction. Mayor? A lot of discussion, great discussion about north, northward movement of bad things. Um, one of the criticisms of the U.S. is what do we do to reduce demand here? Another criticism of the U.S. in Merida, you mentioned uh, guns and money going south, but there's no guts to that. There's behind it. este simposio un público no muy frecuente
integrantes del ejército de los Estados Unidos, académicos, Canadá, Estados Unidos, México, eh, académicos destacados de esta institución, eh, estudiantes de posgrado eh, y algún público interesado. Realmente a mí me pareció extraordinaria la conformación de este público y quiero dejarlo expreso. Felicidades a los organizadores. Roberto said the way that we can approach these issues is by doing what the university does, which is to assemble groups of the community, including academicians, practitioners, elected and appointed officials, and representatives of the news media, to draw attention to these issues and to share our concerns in the hope of a more informed and enlarged arena of public engagement. Mexican government is not doing good because we have a high rate of unemployment. We uh, change our uh, law in, in uh, how the people need to be uh, having works in, in Mexico. I mean, the, the rules are changed in Mexico, but these changes are generated more poverty. And <coughs> I think that. We are producers of a lot of drugs, and, but also we have this problem coming from Central America and South America. We have the same problem that we have in the north of Mexico, we have the same problem in the south of Mexico. And we are always concerned about the treatment that the federal government gives to, to Mexicans, but believe me, this works in south uh, border. Here, the, uh, the people uh, have training in Mexico, don't have training about how to deal with other people from other countries. And in Mexico, now, we are having problems that we have a lot of people from Central America, South America, living in Mexico, illegally. And we are feeling, we are living the same situation that you are living here in USA. That's, now we know the problem because we are having these kind of things that we didn't have before. And, and I sorry I don't have the, the answer, but but I, I believe that uh, we need to do some cooperation. We say we know in Mexico that the president that has put more money to secure the border is Obama, and the president that with more deportation is Obama, and in Mexico they love Obama. So what about Obama? The people say, oh wow, that's a good president, a Democrat president, and, but they don't know that it's the president that has more money to, to, to secure the, the border. And I think that he's doing good because he needs to take care of American citizens. But I don't have any answer to that question. So sorry. <laughs> Steve, it's about time. Maybe you could tell us a little First of all, I'm not sure we Everybody hear me? Yes. The issue is this. The issue is because the United States consumes enormous amounts <coughs> of narcotics. Mm -hmm. That's the issue. What are we prompted to do to prevent this from going on? How do we cut back on this urge from the American public to have to have narcotics? That's what you're driving at. Is that not correct? I don't have a real solid solution to that, but I can tell you this. Our young people need to be educated as to what happens if you get hooked on narcotics. You know, that's number one. Number two, and lo and behold, half of my law enforcement friends will probably turn over in their graves if they're, if they're dead. I think that if we legalize marijuana in the United States, it will cut out an awful big 
chunk of the cartel's budget. And more studies that I read are saying, all right, so marijuana is one time with the evil. It's not right now. In fact, it's got some additional benefits where it, even in this state, people that have a need for it use it, they buy it, and they use it the way it's supposed to be, like a prescription drug. That's number two that you have to do. The third is, if we cut back on the border, and, and I've discussed this with all four of these people, if we cut back on the border, you're going to have more crime in cities like Los Angeles, like Seattle, like Denver, like Albuquerque, Austin, etc., etc., all the way up to the East Coast, all the way to New York. We're going to have more, more crime. Why? <coughs> Because the price of cocaine, the price of heroin is going to double. And if you don't, if you're not making the money, you ain't gonna get the, the stuff. And it's gonna dwindle, it dwindles down to the pit. Supply for the cocaine and, uh, and, uh, and heroin and amphetamines dwindles down. These guys aren't stupid. They're in for it to make money. They're gonna raise the price of that. And that in itself will be a somewhat of a deterrent. The bad aspect, our hospitals are going to be overflowed with, with, with agent, uh, uh, addicts that want to be cleaned up. I'm sorry. I think the sign of symposia is everybody's leaning in and everybody wants to keep going. And it will, but not today. <laughs> what I'd like to do at this point to turn the microphone over to Steve Recca after first congratulating my four panelists and thanking them for their participation. I never thought I would hear Faustino talk about the merits of legalizing marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> At least under controlled circumstances for medical purposes. I mean, i got to live with this guy for a couple more days, so I don't want you beating on me about what I said that he said and what he said. But I think that you have to put all the questions on the table, and you have to listen very carefully to what the answers are. And you have to do so in dos lenguas, in two languages, con respeto, with respect, para dos culturas diferentes, to two cultures each of which views these problems through its own domestic lens and with the help of its own domestic stakeholders. On that, and speaking of domestic stakeholders, I'd like to turn the microphone over to my friend and colleague, Steve Recca, who will close the conference by talking about his thoughts in bringing together this group and Northern Command and all of the internal stakeholders it represents as part of solving these issues that relate to border security and shared human security with Mexico. Steve? Actually, my, my role for the last few minutes here is, uh, is simple. Thank you again. Uh, very enjoyable guy. I do, do want to add one more uh, kudo to Faustino, uh, the fact that Legalized pot, he really does need to be an academia. <laughs> 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 I'm really closing the circle here. Uh, so, uh, again, my part is very easy. Uh, I want to thank you all for attending. Before I, I close out, I'd like to introduce uh, Brigadier General James Taylor. Uh, General Taylor is a deputy J5, which is the Director of Strategy and Policy and Plans at United States Northcom. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, he keeps doing this. But it's uh, North American Aerospace Command and uh, United States Northern Command. Uh, General Taylor, a few remarks, please. Thank you, Steve. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, I very much appreciate the opportunity to spend a few moments uh, with you at the close of what I think has been just a, a great symposium. I, I want to thank the staff and faculty of the School of Public Affairs here for including this as one of the 50th anniversary events. With a, Topics that you all discussed uh, today are, are so very relevant to the security of North America. And from the perspective of the United States Northern Command, uh, although we've made 
really what we consider some very historical advances in our security cooperation with the countries that comprise uh, North America. Uh, one of the threats that we continue to face is the destabilizing influence of transnational organized crime. It does not respect borders. In fact, it exploits both. And so it becomes incumbent upon us, I think, to figure out ways that we can partner uh, in the cooperative defense of North America. And forums like this one that we have today really help you know, foster the kind of dialogue and discussion this is a whole of government, this is a societal issue that we need to apply in order to address these problems. And the insights that uh, you all gathered from this morning's discussion on cooperative approaches to shared human security, uh, combined with the insights that came out of this afternoon's discussion, I think can really help us inform the plan, strategy, and policy changes that are necessary to make North America a safer and more secure. Colonel Russ mentioned in her background slide that she showed the National Action Plan on Women, Peace, and Security. And this is a great plan. It just makes sense. And I did a little internet research. If it's on the internet, it must be true. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, in North America, you know, our, our, our three countries as a, as a whole, um, the women out Life expectancy exceeds men by about four years. They outnumber men. And so I think that's why General Dempsey, our, our chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, you know, said this quote that she showed. I just want to reiterate it. When we do not take advantage of the contributions of one gender, we do so at our peril. We deny ourselves over half the talent, half the resources, and half the potential. So we in NORAD and Northern Command are committed to the implementation of this action plan. We believe that we need to institutionalize the contributions that women can make in security. We believe that we need to partner with stakeholder organizations like this great university to heighten the awareness of the security needs that exist for North America, the potential solutions to the problems that we face. We think that we need to facilitate protection from violence help with the prevention of conflict, we think that we need to improve access to relief and recovery as needed. Uh, over the past two decades, as the world economy has become more globalized, so has its illicit kind. The global impact of transnational organized crime has risen to, frankly, unprecedented levels. Criminal groups have appropriated new technologies. Adapted a network structure that makes them very hard to trace and to stop. They diversified their activities, they're very smart. And the result has been an unparalleled scale of instability, uh, pretty much globally. And these crimes undermine the ability of governments to provide their citizens with basic services. It fuels violent conflict, it subjects people to intolerable suffering, even here in North America. It's something that must be changed. So when you start thinking about the instability that's caused by transnational organized crime, you realize very quickly that it's a hard problem to solve and it's going to require some creative solutions. Because it crosses borders. And our law enforcement institutions in North America, pretty much all three of our, of our countries that have developed over the decades, were constructed to maintain order within territorial boundaries, like cities, or counties, or states, or even transnational organized crime challenges that structure that has developed over the years. So if we're going to fix this problem, it's going to require multilateral initiatives. It's going to take hold of government, it's going to take hold of society in order to address it. And this will be hard because people tend to look at things just within the narrow stovepipe of their organizations with what their agency or department mandate is. And so I think that the insights and observations that have been generated symposium today uh, will help us as we think about what changes do we need to make in policy and legislation. And so we certainly appreciate the brain power that you all have provided uh, to this matter. I want to conclude with a, a quote from General Dwight D. Eisenhower. I think it's timely to, to go back and look at our past and learn from it a little bit. 
So in March of 1947, he made an address in Washington, D.C. at a forum for peace. And he, in that forum, described a model, he described a way for the countries of the world to recover from a conflict that actually transcended the several national borders. He said this, possibly it may help us to realize that there can be no security for one unless it's enjoyed by all. Though force can protect in an emergency, only justice, fairness, consideration, and cooperation amongst all can lead to peace. So I want to thank you all for the time that you spent discussing these critical topics. I want to express my appreciation to this outstanding university for hosting and fostering a rigorous discussion. I never thought I would hear an FBI individual <laughs> legalizing marijuana. Certainly, that must be what happens when you retire. <laughs> but the proceedings of, uh, of this forum are sure to help us contribute to the solution of the problem that is probably a generation or so and take years of uh, concerted effort to, to work together. Now, Dr. Klinger, if you We'd like to just uh, present you a, a token of appreciation uh, from NORAD and Northern Command for partnering and hosting this. Just a, just a little picture of our headquarters with all of the services represented by our Joint Command. Thank you for your This will go directly to Dr. Terry Schwartz, my dean, and the instigator for all of these events that celebrate the School of Public Affairs and our contribution to transforming lives as a community as we work to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the University of Colorado for Colorado Springs. Thank you all for your attendance, your participation, and especially thank you to the leadership of U.S. Northern Man, under the cooperation and the facilitation of Steve Recca, the Executive Director of the Center for Human Security as part of the School of Public Affairs at UCCS, for helping organize this event. Thanks to all of you for being here, and thanks to all of our panelists for your ideas, your insights, and your willingness to work together towards shared solutions to common problems. Thank you. Again.